body mapping and mechanoreceptors. This is a quick and easy beginner's guide. So what are mechanoreceptors? Mechanoreceptors, they are a sensory receptor that responds to mechanical pressure or distortion. These are not pain receptors. Tissues actually don't have pain receptors. They have mechanical receptors, sensing pressure, stimulation, vibration, movement, etc. They are innervated by sensory neurons that convert mechanical pressure into electrical signals that in animals are sent to the central nervous system. Mechanoreceptors detect stimuli such as touch, pressure, vibration, and sound from the external and internal environments. So when you're working with the horse's mechanoreceptors and you're doing targeted work to stimulate these areas, you're having a direct line of communication with their central nervous system and you can influence this in infinitely positive ways. And in terms of body mapping, in a simple way, we are stimulating and activating regions of the horse's body that normally receive little or no stimulation, or areas of the body where the horse shows pathological balance and alignment. And on the Patreon, I've got another video here where I address three different types of body balance in a horse. So go ahead to the search button and click body balance, and you'll find that uh, tutorial will come up for you. So a little example, a little example of what we're doing in a human form. Right now, touch your nose. Now that you're touching your nose, are you now more or less aware of your nose for touching it? Of course, because you touched it, you're now more aware of it than when you weren't touching it. It's about where your brain is concentrating. If you think about your concentration like the searchlight on a lighthouse, you cannot be aware of everything all the time, but you can have a dynamic awareness that keeps shining its light on different areas of the body. Now, tap your kneecap gently. Are you now more or less aware of this body part right now? What kind of sensations do you feel from the tapping? Is it comfortable? Is it uncomfortable? Does it make you angry? Does it make you playful? Right? These are questions we ask ourselves and we can ask our horses in sessions like this. Important that when we're working with horses that we work with objects of stimulation that the horse finds non-threatening. Or if they are threatened, we use cat H or R plus or similar to quickly overcome those fears. Cat H is a really modern version of desensitization where you remove the object, not when the horse stops behaving or showing behavioral responses, you remove the object when the horse engages with it, with the social, social engagement system. Um, it's just sort of a really modern version of desensitization. And R plus, of course, is positive reinforcement. Positive reinforcement is really useful in these sessions because it gives an immediate understanding to the horse and allows us to work very quickly because when you're stimulating their body, you have about 10 minutes in these sessions to work effectively. You don't want to work longer than 10 minutes because you can make the horses manic, overwhelmed, or overstimulated if you're working longer than 10 minutes. So I like to use a variety of different objects. I've got my uh, my mats here. You feel a little bit like a kindergarten teacher. I've got all my mats uh, and sometimes I've also used barrels and sleeping mattresses and uh, I mean poles. The, the, the list is endless. You are only limited by your own creativity so long as your horse isn't threatened by them. And if they are threatened by them then your job is to overcome that threat. And I've got my favorite feather duster here. <clears throat> my horses are not afraid of the feather duster because I have charged the feather duster with R+, meaning just like this, touch the feather duster, get a reward. So this is how you charge up the object with R+, so that the horse sees it as non-threatening and as something that they should be seeking, 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 seeking. We're looking for the seeking system here. We're looking for puzzle solving skills in the horse. So that was a little bit of mechanoreceptor work there on his chest. Did you miss that? <laughs> Watch very carefully because I work very quickly here. Again, I've got 10 minutes. I've set no timer, but every time I've done this and filmed it, I've always hit that 10 minute point. So now I'm stimulating the withers and I'm looking for him to lift the withers and shift his weight backwards. He does, he gets a reward. I have vague ideas in my head what I'm looking for from the horse. 
Um, I think, oh, maybe if I touch here, I'll look for when they go backwards. But honestly, any movement the horse offers in response to a mechanoreceptor signal, any movement at all, is welcome and valid. My pivot just had a little bit of a crazy moment there when it tracked the other horses coming through. So we're looking for any movement at all. Now I'm going to stimulate. I'm going to stimulate his hind quarter here. Actually, his hock. He lifted the hock, and I reward. So he's really well body mapped on the right hock. He's got less of a body map going on with the left. So I think he's had some pain in that left leg at some point in the past. And so he's moving it, but I'd like him to really engage that hock. So I'm kind of sticking with that one. Good. He stepped it underneath himself. And it's really, really simple. I mean, it's child's play. It literally is child's play. And so any movement, any movement at all is good movement. You're looking for them to respond. Any response at all. It's about creativity. You allow the horse a creative response. And there is really no wrong answer. There are maybe better answers than others, but there's really no wrong answer here for the horse. And I've kind of got the mat sort of strewn everywhere. And when he gets on them, it's challenging his proprioception and changes the way he feels from the ground up by accident. So sort of supercharging that. And you notice I'm not doing the same thing over and over again. I quickly swap between different body map zones. So I want to body map him here a little bit because he tends to get his belly out slightly. So waiting for the belly, lifted and engaged that very slightly, rewarded that. Now I'm actually going to use the wall to get a crunch out of him like that. <laughs> like a school halt, sort of, but I'm using the wall. Um, I've done this on wooden walls before and he broke them. So now I only use very strong walls. So I was looking for a real big shift of weight backwards there. This is like doing a crunch for Sani. You know, he figured out that movement on his own in response to the mechanoreceptor work because he became aware of that part of his body and he's like, ooh, I know I'm being asked to move in response to where I'm being touched and this is the movement that makes the most sense to me. So that's what we got. And I really welcome any movement at all. Any movement at all. Good. Good. So there, I'm actually asking him to bend the head around and touch it by bending his neck and his head around. So here, I'm stimulating that shoulder. And you saw that he shifted his weight onto the shoulder. But my idea is that he makes that shoulder a little bit light. So now he's thinking, maybe I... I come up and I lift back with that crunch of his neck he's doing there. I'm actually looking for a lightness in that shoulder. So I am being a little bit picky there. There he came off that shoulder and I rewarded that. But he could only come off the shoulder if he shifted his weight, what? To the hindquarters. So this is kind of a very, very modern, very contemporary, very non-pretty in particular way to teach the horse the essences of collection without driving them forward, without drive and restrain, without excessive laterals, we can kind of teach the horse the fundamentals of collected posture. And it's been my experience that these sorts of sessions are best done in very tight, very small, very intimate environments. Now I've got Sani stable open, so if he wanted to apart if it became too much for him and he wants to go into his stable he can and sometimes he does he's like oh I need a break and I let him go in I just I don't follow him in there I don't ask him to come back out he comes back out when he's ready so the horse is with you of their own volition and using a small space actually challenges them to use their body because they can't just go blindly forwards and go straight and like run out of the environment they have to uh the small tight environment is a challenge for them. One way I like to describe it, here we go for a little bit of a hind quarter. Very nice. So one way I like to describe it, have you ever tried to get out of your car by climbing into the passenger seat from the driver's seat and then climbing out the window? You can imagine 
the ways in which your body is challenged when you have to do that by kind of twisting yourself into a small space. This is a similar kind of idea here, but we're using lots of positive reinforcement, so it's not a negative association because it is highly challenging. So again, I'm stimulating that chest zone, which as a draft horse, he has the tendency to get kind of locked down and heavy in his chest there. So again, I'm stimulating the chest. I want lightness in the chest. And obviously he does that sometimes by just throwing his great big skull backwards. Uh, and that's okay, that's a movement solution, but ultimately I'm looking for something with a thoracic sling and he got it there. Once he got on the little mat there, he was able to find it. So that's about as much as mechanoreceptor work I wanna do today. So now I'm just purely, this is uh, totally spontaneous. I'm just doing some targeting here with him. Um, and he's attracted to the red color, red. So every time he touches the red, I say red and I reward him, uh, sort of teaching him the different color, red, <laughs> good boy. Why am I doing this? Because it's fun, because you can't take yourself too seriously when you do this kind of work with a horse. And um, it's a really good filter in your environment, if you're around other horse people when you're doing this, you'll filter out the prejudiced people real quick because they'll look at you and turn their nose up at this sort of exercise and they'll think you're absolutely crazy. Um, and then the people who think what you're doing is kind of fun and nice for the horse, they'll come to you and say, hey, that looks like a lot of fun. That looks really cool. So now he's really consistently targeting the red. And he'll make a mistake at some point. Oh, this one's a challenge. Oh no, still got it. <laughs> horses are smart. He know that. Horses are so smart. Let's check, try with yellow. Still, he gets the red. So something about his vision allows him to see the red much easier. Well, he got the yellow that time. And figured out the red. Very good. So when he starts making mistakes like that, that's my cue that we're at the end of the cycle in his brain of being able to tolerate this kind of exercise without getting manic. So I won't do it too many more times. Virtually finished. Good boy. Yes, now we're finished. Now we're finished. Very good. Okay, so I'm gonna do it with um, my other horse as well. I've got probably about a minute left here. We're about nine minutes in. I'm just checking to see how fluid and responsive he might be without a target, if he can respond to my hand as well. And I find that he can. Any movement is the goal. Any movement is the goal. Good. And once the horse starts getting manic for the food rewards, that's when you know you've reached the end of the cycle. Brains kind of work in these cycles of tolerance where they can concentrate for certain periods of time, and then they have to recycle. Um, and if you do too, too much prolonged exposure to the same kind of movement, then you really start to break them. Uh, and breaking can be everything from manic behavior to shutdown behavior. And it's something I always look for and try to avoid. It can happen even in traditional training and riding. If you're trotting for longer than 10 minutes, working on exactly the same thing for longer than 10 minutes, you're not training the horse, you're breaking them. So this is my little squid. I know, mm. Using the word squid's a little bit unfair, but he is just funnily put together and it's not his fault. So you're going to see Sani raging because he's not part of the game and he actually knows how to open that door. <laughs> Sani wants to play, but it's Caleb's turn. Sani realizes that Caleb has left his food, so he's going to go and eat Caleb's food instead. Okay, so I'm doing the same thing with Caleb. Very different horse. Um, a lot more cautious, a lot more afraid. He's a lot more afraid of the environment. He's a lot more afraid of pressure. See that, that frightens him. 
he's uh, very, very skeptical, so he's struggling with his domestication. So here, that's cat H. He engaged with the object, I removed the object. That's a trigger. That was a trigger. Engage with the object, remove the object, and I'm rewarding him as well. So I'm doing cat H mixed with R plus here. That's a trigger, I am afraid. I don't go after him with it. I allow him to move away, and I allow him to come back. So he has a fear panic response immediately turns into curiosity or seeking. Immediately starts to turn into play. So that's what? A five second period and we had the full spectrum of emotional expression come forth from him. Very good. That was wonderful. You saw him really think about that. It's like, oh, that's unusual. Should I be afraid of that? No, I shouldn't. Good. So at the moment, the nose is a safe place. His body mapping for the nose is very, very good. He's very aware of his nose. He's very confident with his nose. He's not confident with his hindquarters. Reminding you, this horse has a tumor in his sheath that every time he engages his hindquarters in collection, the tumor gets pounded on by his thighs and causes him shooting pain into his hindquarters. So his body mapping from his withers backwards is very, very low. If you would imagine it as lights, his, his whole hindquarters is in darkness and his nose is in the light. So I keep offering him this and I allow him to be frightened. I allow him to walk away and I allow him also to come back when he's ready. And I've got no rope on him to force him to this. There he went to stand behind me. I'm just rubbing him with the object there and he says, oh, that actually feels nice. I'm aware of my shoulder now. That actually feels nice, he says. Oh, that doesn't hurt. Oh, that doesn't hurt. Can I be rewarded for it not hurting? Good, and now he moved, so there we are. There we are. We just started mechanoreceptor. Let's just replay that. So here, he's overcome the fear, realizing that it's not threatening, looks at me. There's a bit of care there as well. A little bit of care, he says, can I be rewarded? Can I be rewarded? And I say, actually stimulate this zone and I'm looking for movement. I've got the reward prepared, stimulate the zone. He moved in response to that stimulation, immediate reward. So that's the first moment. We're already about, what, a minute and a half, two minutes in. That was the first moment where the mechanoreceptor exercise worked. We overcame the domestication issue, and now we have a window. There, movement. He's still unsure, he's still wary, but movement for his, during his lifetime has been consistently painful for him to move. So little sessions like this, where he's not expected to run up mountains or go around an arena or around pen, um, where he's just asked to move very, very small parts of his body in very small and detailed ways with huge awareness can, over time, build his body confidence back as a horse that loves to move. So there, I'm stimulating his shoulder. He moved it. Reward for that. And notice also a shift of weight into the hindquarters as well. So I'm starting with his front end. I've moved the awareness light. <laughs> the body mapping searchlight. I moved it back from his nose. I moved it to his shoulder. And now I'm moving it back here. And there I even went underneath towards the tumor. There was a bit of a shift of weight back. Beautiful reward for that. Touching the, the belly. He doesn't use his stomach muscles. One, because his breathing is horrific. Um, so it's very hard for him being so rump high. And he's actually on a slope now. So he's rump high with his rump on the top of a slope. So it's exaggerated his rump highness now, um, which is also a good thing. It's good that this is a slight slope and that it's not perfectly flat. Um, so remapping these areas of his body are going to help him get his confidence back. When using that part of your body has been consistently painful. Anytime someone would touch it, you're suspicious of it. Good, beautiful, there was even collection there. So the tumor is uh, benign. 
but it is a very hard mass and a very awkward position. It allows him to urinate. Um, and I am monitoring its size. If it did start to swell up in size, then we have a difficult decision to make. But so far, it doesn't impede him in any way, except that it causes him pain when he collects his body because of its 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 placement. And it's probably been there for a very long time. There, did you see that weight shift backwards? Beautiful. So he doesn't use his stomach because if he engaged his stomach muscles, um, it would cause him to tuck his pelvis underneath himself and to shift his weight onto his hocks, which would cause his thighs to bang into that tumour. So that body map zone is totally dark and totally pathological. And you can really see it from this angle here, how out his belly is. And actually, he lost a lot of weight in the summertime because he got really fat in the spring. So I put him on a, a diet in the summer and he got quite thin and the ribs came through, but the belly stayed exactly the same size because we can't be anthropomorphic when we're looking at a horse's body condition. Belly fat in horses doesn't exist. They don't collect fat on their belly. It says something about their fitness. It says something about their pathology, like what he has. It says something about a high fiber, low protein diet, but they don't collect body fat there. So his belly is not uh, pursuant to his diet, other than he's got an appropriately high fiber diet and um, severe pathology. So I'm working on these areas. He's allowing me now with this previously threatening object to come in there and stimulate this dark zone of his body. There he's disengaging. So here he's doing a fear response. So I'm just holding the object onto him and I want him just to engage with it. There he does. Food reward, food reward, food reward. I am probably the first person to ever use food rewards on this horse um, in a sort of structured training way. And I've found them to be very effective on him because he has a um, he has been overdone with pressure in his life. If you look on the Patreon, there's another video here called Reinforcement Minimal where I explain uh, the theory behind this. Um, I really recommend you have a look at it because it can really inform what I'm doing here with him, how he has an increased capacity to tolerate food rewards because he's had an overused capacity for pressure in his life. So any movement at all, which doesn't come from fear, but comes from stimulation of his body, I am rewarding. And if he does have a fear response, I hold space, I allow him to have that fear response, and I don't try to fix it. Fear is a cycle. He has to go through that fear cycle. Okay, this is really interesting. Watch what I'm doing here with my feet. I'm seeing if he can follow my feet. Step over. Good. You see there, he stepped to the sideways the same time I did. I'm looking to see if he can engage with me in movement. We missed it. Missed the boat. Let's try again. Very nice. <laughs> so I've taken the target away and now I'm using myself. I'm just trying to engage his social engagement system to turn off the sympathetic nervous system. I want him just to engage with me. I don't want him shut down in parasympathetic. I just want him to engage. So when I move, you move. There's a slight latency with the step, but this is the first time I've done it with him. Can he mirror what I do? Yes, he does every time with those fronts. We know that his body awareness and his body mapping on the front end is far superior to his hind. So I'm working on building that up a little bit more because this can give him more confidence. The more light I shed on his confident zones, the more light he has in his body, which I can then use to shift to darker zones in his body. I had a craniosacral worker come and look at him during the summer as well. And she said that he's numb to his body. He almost doesn't even know that he has a body. So this sort of training for him is absolutely perfect. A little bit of a fear response there. So now again, I'm just touching those zones. It stands to reason that if you didn't know you had the body that you had, and then when you become aware that you have that body, that that can be slightly overwhelming. Like 
if I suddenly showed you that you had a tail, a human being, if I suddenly showed you that you had a tail and you didn't know you had it, that would be slightly overwhelming, right? Similar of what's happening here. Remember, horses diverge from us in their intellect uh, quite a fair bit. So we can look in a mirror and we can know what we're looking at. Horses can't. So right at the end there, I sort of patted him between the eyes and he had a big, <sighs> like this, which is exactly what you want. Okay, I hope that was interesting for you guys. And um, let me know how you go and uh, what sort of fun you get up to with your horses.